question. Thank you, Sid. Um, so our first question uh, is, recently, uh, the Supreme Court has made headlines by both taking up a case regarding affirmative action and with President Biden's pledge to appoint a black woman to the court. How do you respond to those in leadership positions, leadership or hiring positions, who say we should just hire or promote the best person for the job, regardless of race or gender? And we can start with Adrea again and then work our way around the morning as we move forward. Thank you. I have the pleasure of going first two times in a row. Uh, that's that's good. <laughs> uh, can I can I first say that uh, you guys were not playing around with your questions um, in terms of the um, and the depth of uh, the depth that they are. I often get asked questions that are uh, fairly, um, I don't know, very little thought involved. It's like, oh, how do you navigate your day? Um, which are fine. I love answering those two. But uh, so I did, I did think a little bit on those. So thank you. <laughs> thank you to all of you who came up with questions. Um, so first, I agree that you should hire the best person for the job. Um, but I, and because I don't think that you should hire anyone solely based off of one criteria. That being said, I think there are many criteria that go into deciding who is the right person for that job, and particularly maybe at that time. Um, so when I look at, you know, when I see the comment of, you know, Biden, President Biden saying he wants to hire uh, or he wants to appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court, I, I think of that as saying that makes sense because I'm looking at the court itself and who was represented and who was not represented and trying to understand if uh, what perspectives are not there. And that to me says he's thinking about what would be the best person for that job. And that doesn't mean I'm assuming that everyone would be qualified, right? He's not saying I'm going to nominate someone who wasn't qualified um, or I'm going to appoint someone who wasn't qualified or nominate someone who wasn't qualified. Uh, he's saying that this is a perspective that is missing. And I think that's how I approach many of my own hiring decisions. I've hired several people and I'm always looking to see who is the best person and then what can they add to my team to make my team better, to make what we do better and diverse, diverse perspectives are part of that. I don't think I've ever um, been in a position where I could say specifically what type of person I was hiring simply because I may not have had that applicant pool um, at my disposal, but certainly that's what I'm always looking for um, in thinking that diverse perspectives and diverse team members always bring about the greatest level of work, the best level of work, definitely people who think differently uh, and have different experiences at least than I do. So I 100% agree, but I think it's also subjective based off of time, uh, the point in time and the makeup of the team and where the, um, the direction is going uh, and diversity just has to be part of that. That is a great answer. Thank you. Uh, James, you want to take, uh, take it next? Uh, sure, sure. Um, th this is definitely a, a question that you have to really think about. Um, you know, it, you, you don't want to, you know, come across as just saying that you want to hire someone you know, based off of uh, race or gender, but you know, to to break it down um, in the climate that we're in now, um, me owning my own company, I do want to hire the best people. I do want to hire, you know, those that could push our company forward. But I would be crazy to say that I don't want to help my community as well, um, seeing where we are in this industry. Um, first and foremost, is that sometimes we do need a boost um, to kind of catch up to where we should be right now. Um, so I would say that, you know, how uh, President Biden is saying that he's going to um, appoint a woman to that position, sometimes you do have to take that step or that leap. Um, he's going to get a lot of backlash about it. Uh, he can't go into it, you know, you know thinking about that. And same with me, you know, when I hire, I do want a diverse team, but I'm also looking to promote my community so they can pass that down, so they can pass those leadership roles down, you know, uh, generations after that, because uh, we're not going to make a change totally right now, um, but if we um, entwine that into what we're doing, and if it keeps going and going, you know, we can build our community up. Um, as a black community. Um, so that's uh, that's how I feel about it. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Frederick. 
thanks. Um, I, I agree with all the comments that the panelists um, have already said, but I'll just speak about it more from a law firm perspective. Um, you know, I, when I was the diversity partner, one thing I really pushed was hiring um, diverse summer associates, um, diverse associates. And I think some of the problems that we run into law firms is that you really tend to, or law firms tend to want to focus on a, a certain law school, um, certain undergraduate school, certain grades, and all that is very important. But sometimes that doesn't translate into what's going to be a resilient um, attorney who can withstand all the ups and downs that may come, you may come across in your field. So diversity really, to me, looking beyond just your law school, looking beyond grades, looking at who you are as a person, um, you know, maybe going to um, different law schools to recruit, some that may not be in like the, the first tier, I think is, is really important. And then, um, you know, trying to ensure that the associates you do hire are representative of what you know the world or or the United States looks like. We can't all you know hire one specific type of associate. So diversity is is important, and I think firms in particular are starting to recognize that and looking outside the box of what they typically did when they're hiring for um, associate positions. Awesome, thank you, and uh, Mr. Davis. So what? What studies have shown, what psychologists will tell you, what our common experience in, in our lived experiences tell us um, is that we, no matter who we are, naturally gravitate towards people that are more like us. Each one of us struggles with uh, implicit bias and that, will, that cuts all kinds of different directions. Uh, I joke tongue in cheek with uh, with Jalon uh, and with James, uh, but the reality is is that every single one of us that went to an HBCU, whether it was Morehouse or Norfolk State or Spelman or somewhere else, has a common experience. And so, all other things being equal, you are naturally drawn towards someone who might have that shared experience, and we have to interrupt that and focus consciously on diversifying the team, and that is whether you are running a business, whether you are running a firm, um, whether you are in-house or, or what you are doing, um, having a diverse team naturally tends towards getting a better overall result because you've got diverse perspectives. Um, I, I was just thinking as I was listening to Adrea, you know, the, the reality is, is that, um, you know, you, you may have heard the saying, you know, the game is chess, not checkers. Uh, but that has layers to it. Uh, you talk about who the best person is for a job. Well, that depends. If all you have left on the board are rooks, a knight might be pretty good. But if you already have all knights, you don't want a knight. You want a rook or a bishop because you're trying to diversify what you can do. And the problem that we have and that people overlook when they say just hire the best person for the job is what you see are people making hiring decisions that uh, reflect their values and what they look like and who they are. Uh, and that's not to say there's any anemis that's involved, but if we're not careful, we end up surrounding ourselves with people that are similar to us. Uh, and so it's important that you actually focus uh, and specifically on the point of a black woman. I mean, you know, we're talking about 225 plus years in this country and there's never there's never been a black woman on the court high time that there is one because that's a diverse perspective that can change the views of the court for the overall good thank y'all very much those are excellent answers and uh, Ms. frederick you touched on uh diversity programs the firm starting up diversity programs um what advice do you have for students who, are, who feel like they are left out of these programs um, as well as those who have been given these opportunities who may feel like they're just being given these opportunities uh, because they come from diverse backgrounds. And we can start with you, Ms. Frederick, on this one. Sure. So I always encourage um, law students to reach out to attorneys at law firms, um, maybe find someone that has a similar background to yours so you can have a connection and reach out and, and get advice. Because I think one thing that I found when I was more junior is that's what I didn't do and I wish I had is built relationships with 
attorneys who were, you know, working in the government, working in law firms, so I could understand what they did and how, and, and ultimately when you form those relationships, they can help you, um, you know, maybe identify a firm or an opportunity where, where you could get acceptance into one of these programs or, you know, assist you in, in, in having you feel included in um, developing your career. So I think networking, I think, is, is really important. And I know it's difficult sometimes to do a cold call or a cold email to um, someone that you don't know. But if you're pretty persistent about it and follow up, most, I think, uh, attorneys who are interested in helping out law students are going to respond and set up at least you know, a few minutes to speak with you and, and help you with any questions you may have about your career. I know I, I do it pretty frequently and I'm sure everyone here on the panel also would, would be open to that as well. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, James. Would you like, all right, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Davis here and then I have another question for James and Adrian. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and so this is a little bit of a variation of a theme on what uh, Maurice said, but I completely agree with her. Uh, if I um, could go back to my uh, 1L or 2L self in 1997 or 1998 uh, and give myself one piece of advice, it would be um, to build those relationships to network with people that I went to undergrad with in grad school and law school, uh, because what you, what you learn is you grow and spend time in this business, uh, particularly as a diverse attorney, is that it's really not six degrees of separation. It's more like two. Uh, and business gets done based on personal relationships a lot of times. Um, I don't want to speak for Adrea, um, but my experience with clients has been, yes, they're looking for quality lawyers, but uh, those quality th those are qualities that are necessary, but not sufficient. They want somebody who understands their business. They want somebody who understands um, what it is that they're looking for. And so when you build those relationships before the lawsuit gets filed, uh, reaching out for a cold call isn't going to be um, as effective as if you have already established that relationship. The same is true as a student. Uh, I, I say this all the time uh, to our students that interview and particularly our diverse attorneys. Uh, you got to have a thick skin and you got to be bloodied and unbowed. Um, this is some, I love doing programs like this because I want everyone to be encouraged, whether you're diverse or not, um, that we got to put our big boy pants and our big girl pants on um, and keep at that effort. Uh, I will tell you, uh, when I interviewed at Fish, uh, I didn't get a summer position uh, and wasn't hired. And that happened to a lot of other firms. Uh, and I joke and I say, you know, it, it's interesting. It's amazing how I suddenly became a lot smarter and a lot more handsome after those two clerkships. But the reality is, is that that made me more marketable. Um, and so don't be discouraged if uh, you reach out to an attorney and maybe it takes them a long time to get back to you or they don't they don't invest in you the way that you hope keep trying keep making those connections and stay on your grind uh, because it's not going to be easy uh, and even when you think you have achieved uh, you're not at an apex you're at a plateau you've got another mountain to climb so so stay focused and don't give up awesome thank you and so for james and Andrea, um you guys have a different perspective because you aren't actually in law firms. Uh, so our next question is, uh, what advice do you have for students from underrepresented communities entering the legal workforce where there is a lack of diversity in their uh, workplace? And so uh, James, if you want to take us on first. Sure. Um, I so the advice for students entering this workforce is to, <clears throat> You have to go into it with your eyes open. Um, I tell you, for example, when I started at uh, IBM, I was the only black attorney there um, in the office. Out of you know maybe fifty attorneys, I was the only black attorney um, there. And a funny story is, and it, you know, I saw another black guy walking down the hall one day, and um, you know, you know, I was shocked, and and so I, you know, you know, I caught up with him, and he was um, interviewing for a position, and so I took him out to lunch, and I, you know, I found out that he was, uh, he was one of my frat brothers, uh, Cap Alpha Psi, and you know, so I talked to him, and you know, I was able to help him, 
help them navigate uh, to get that position. And so I feel like us coming into these positions that we're um, afforded to, we, we have to keep our eyes open and we have to uh, make sure that we're there to help out uh, those coming after us um, in any way we can. Um, um, uh, for example, with Jalen, uh, one of our professors uh, connected us and that, you know, you know, I was so happy that someone else from Norfolk State uh, was pursuing um, IP. And so, you know, we've talked to, uh, we talked a few times and, um, and whatever I can do to help him in his career, you know, I'll be willing to do. But I think that we have to take it. We can't just do what's best for ourselves right now. We have to do what's best for the community, for everyone coming behind us. And as long as we keep that thought process, I think that, you know, we'll be fine in these jobs, in these firms, in these uh, companies, and then we'll have a better representation. Um, so, so we don't have to rely on, you know, these programs, but these, um, but these programs are great, you know, for what they're doing. Um, they're getting those uh, people that may not have had that, that chance, like uh, for myself, um, I may not have gotten a look, but for these programs. So um, I think that these programs are great, but we have to uh, um, continue to move that needle forward. Thank you very much. And that was a great connection that she made. <laughs> very grateful yeah. for that. Uh, go ahead, Adrian. Yeah, I'll say James, our experiences uh, at very different companies are very similar. Uh, I also started at Harley Davidson as the only black attorney, at least in the office. There was one more who I hadn't met uh, took me a long time to meet who was in our Miami office at the time. Um, but I will say before I came to Harley Davidson, I was in kind of a utopia where I was, uh, the firm that I was at was uh, owned by a black woman and it was only black attorneys who were there, myself and another gentleman. Um, also, I'm a Spelman grad as well, Marisa. And, uh, and uh, my, my former boss was also a Spelman grad. So we were just having all kinds of fun um, inclusive fun and, you know, just like a wonderful, wonderful environment. I knew Harley Davidson would be different, uh, but I didn't realize how different uh, until I got there. And, you know, on the other side of it, not interviewing, I looked for community uh, in, this, in the same way that Marisa was, was discussing, right? I looked for other people um, who, like other Black people who were outside of the department, right? And if you're in a law firm, that might be um, other other people who are outside of your practice group, you know, depending on how big it is and trying to make connections and just asking, you know, what what is it getting comfortable what's going on um, and building building the network outside of my particular department and that has proved to be very beneficial for just simply networking purposes because I know different people around the organization even better, um, as well as having um, that opportunity to feel comfortable. Um, in my own department. Since then, we've hired uh, at least three more people, uh, three more Black people in the department. So, I mean, things like that have, it, it's improved, but certainly it's a feeling of, you know, how do I navigate? And I think you navigate it probably in the same way that you've been working to navigate law school, uh, considering Bolsa has rejuvenated itself uh, at UNH, right? You guys all came together to form community and have these conversations that you're having right now, and you seek to do and have that same kind of community. Um, in your workforce, at least, or in your workplace. And that's what that's what's worked out very well for me um, and helped me successfully. That's awesome. And, Jay, and Jaylon, you just heard now, you got two Spelmanites and a Morehouse man on the call. Y'all can pop that Norfolk State junk if you want to. We got you. <laughs> we all know that Norfolk State is the best. It's okay, though. Um, so actually, uh, you know, our next question is actually for uh, a Norfolk State grad. Um, so James, you're an entrepreneur, um, you founded IPGen. Um, do you feel like you have to work harder to secure clientele, um, in a predominantly white industry as an entrepreneur, or how do you, how do you feel yourself navigating that space? Um, I wouldn't say for the clientele, I think the, I think the largest, uh, frustrations for a black entrepreneur, black startup founder is is the is the funding and the resources and now there are a lot of organizations that are you know that are helping um that are helping um black founders and um, underrepresented founders and one um 
that I, you know, have to speak to this organization in Maryland named uh, TEDCO. And so without TEDCO's help, you know, we would probably, you know, not be where we are today and not going to where we're going in the near future. Um, they, um, uh, they provided us with funding as well as um, executive support because when I first found at IPGen, um, I was an attorney. And so, you know, I thought I knew certain things, but it's a different, it's a different world. And I had to humble myself and, you know, start from the bottom and learn how to manage people, how to, how to run an organization, how to deal with the financials, how to do all of these things, because as a founder, you have to wear a lot of hats. So, you know, the, um, the largest frustration would be the funding. And as you know, you're, uh, you're very much isolated when you're starting out as well. Um, it's a lonely thing. Um, and so you have to, you know, get people around you to, you know, help you or push you along and, and things of that nature. So, um, you know, any, um, any entrepreneurs out there, um, you'll always see them trying to network and them trying to build that community because it's, it's difficult trying to, you know, start something and push it forward um, on your own. Uh, which is what I was doing for a long time. But the best part about this and what I'm trying to do is that I built a strong team around me. And now, you know, uh, that alleviates uh, some of those frustrations. And so now the biggest frustration would be the funding because I believe it's, it's, it's less than 2% of venture capital goes to black founders and black women get uh, less than a half percent, I believe. So like, it's still a long ways to go. Um, but we're trying to push forward and, and break those barriers right now for us and for the people coming behind us. That is awesome, James. And uh, the company, I, I love what you're doing there. I really, I really, every demo you've shown me, I really enjoyed what you have going on. Thank you. Uh, so our next question, and uh, just a little bit more background on all of our panelists here. Uh, there's a very diverse array in schools, as you can see, but there's also a diverse array in degree. Um, everyone here except for Andrea is a chemistry major, um, so uh, we all have that going for us as well. Um, I only get cool people to do panels. Um, so only 1.7% of IP attorneys are African American. Uh, what do you think IP professionals could do to get more black students, specifically in STEM, uh, to be more interested in IP law? And we can start with uh, Ms. Frederick. So that actually is a great question and sort of a passion of mine. I'm a member of the Intellectual Property Owner Association's IP Outreach Committee. And our main focus is trying to increase the awareness of STEM um, in elementary students and hopefully in the long run, increase the number of students going into IP. And some of the ways we thought about doing it and, and some of the programs we have is um, having like a, a Girl Scout patch day, for example, where we introduce young girls to the concept of intellectual property, um, you know, teaching about patents, very introductory level, um, trademarks and copyrights, what they're about. Um, we are active in science fairs to show that, you know, there are women, people of color who are going into science to hopefully, so it'll be seen as an area that they can themselves go into because they see other people who look like them doing it. Um, one of the things I found to be most helpful at the high school level, um, just in getting students who are interested in STEM, but also getting interested in law, is sort of exposing them early to the process of how um, patent law works. And so one program I did a couple years ago before the pandemic was with a local DC high school. And we took some young girls to argue before the PTAB. Um, so it was a, a patent. They were arguing to real PTAB judges on why this particular um, patent wasn't obvious. And it was a very simple invention. It was like the, St the Stouffer's peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And they really enjoyed it and they learned about the concepts of obviousness and anticipation. And afterwards, I remember one of the young girls walking up to me and saying, oh my God, this is the best activity. I think this is something I could really see myself 
doing as a career. And if you know we hadn't done that, they, she probably never would have been exposed to that. So I think the more that attorneys in the legal community can get out and get involved and expose you know, elementary school students, high school students to IP law, I think it could just serve to benefit the number of people actually going into the field. Awesome. And um, uh, Mr. Davis, would you like to add on to that? Uh, yeah, sure. So I agree. And uh, I think that the challenge uh, really from, so, so Marisa talked about um, reaching out through an IPO subcommittee, uh, which is great. I'm going to address this somewhat from the perspective of the firm itself and some of the challenges that we face at a firm. Uh, there is an inverse correlation between um, how, how close someone is uh, to either going to law school or graduating from law school and pursuing a career in IP and our ability to get the firm committed uh, to invest in uh, you know, everyone, but in particular uh, diverse folks from, uh, from a, a young or middle school or high school age. Uh, and the reason is because the further you go back, you know, the less likely it is that the firm itself uh, will see a benefit from that investment. And so that's the challenge that we faced at FISH a number of years. Yes, there are people who, who care a lot about making that investment further upstream. Marisa is exactly right that piquing the interest of younger, younger students at an earlier age is important. Uh, one of the things that we've done for probably almost 20 years now, not quite, but almost 20 years now, is uh, have a scholarship for middle school students uh, at a in, in four or five different cities where, I, where we have offices and award scholarships in, uh, in each city to two or three students uh, to attend space camp uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, and I think it's Johnson Space Center. Uh, and that's something that really has, I think, been an opportunity to pique the interest of students. I don't know that the firm has done as good a job as it could in tracking that. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the real challenge that we face. Overall, you know, as, as you will hear me say when you get here, Jalon, and I may have said to you already, um, I, I feel highly blessed to be where I am uh, and recognize the opportunities that I have. And the only way that I can think of where I can even come close to paying it back is paying it forward. And so what has to happen at the end of the day is Marisa and Andrea and James and I and you and the people in that room have to reach out to folks and tell them about this opportunity and this field that we're in. Uh, I've known Marisa now for a long time, but didn't learn until she introduced herself uh, that early on she had an interest in uh, forensics because that's how I came into IP as well. I didn't really understand what the intersection was. I knew that I had an interest in science. I knew that I had an interest in the law. I was like, you know, I don't know what to do with that. I don't want to go to medical school. I guess forensics is what it is. Uh, and during a summer uh, job in college uh, at Bell Labs in New Jersey, they would have individuals come and speak to us in like a tea and cookies type Friday afternoon. And they had someone come who had been a bench chemist for 15 years, got tired of it, and then went to law school at night and moved over into the patent department. And a light bulb immediately went off for me. I said, that's what I want to do. Uh, and that's really what put me on the path. And I didn't learn that until my junior year in college. And, and I think we can reach people much earlier uh, and, and stoke those interests. That, that if, if we are able to get our companies and our firms uh, on board from, from a financial standpoint, that's fantastic. Uh, but my experience has been that we're gonna need to, to do that legwork and proselytize on our own as much as we can uh, as you know, an effort to increase the rate of good. That is an excellent answer. Um, Andrea, would you like to tackle this from a trademark perspective? In a non-STEM perspective? Uh, I was, <laughs> was going to say I'm the least qualified uh, to, to answer this question. Uh, sometimes I wish I had gone and gotten a science degree, uh, for sure, especially when I came to uh, Franklin Pierce 
And so much of the school is just filled with science and engineering majors. Um, but then as I look back, I, I recognize that that was not for me. So um, I, I applaud everyone who has their science degrees. Um, I know that you all are all smarter than me. So um, <laughs> I, will, I will call on you guys when I need some help. <laughs> um, just, just a quick comment um, from a non-legal perspective. You know, Harley Davidson is filled with engineers and um, is very committed to STEM itself. Obviously, not necessarily from a legal perspective, but uh, from an ongoing perspective, there are not as many Black engineers either. It's very, very, um, gosh, I, we only have a handful at the company. And so they're also trying to just increase STEM awareness um, at the high school level. And we've had, Marisa, we've had Girl Scouts come into our plant, right, to, to see what happens at the manufacturing facilities and how all of that can can be a part of uh, a potential future for them, uh, partnerships with high schools as well um, to get them interested in STEM. And I think these are all very good things and hopefully they can open the door um, to someone who's might be like, yeah, I like science, but maybe I like law. And that can you know, help get them to that avenue of pursuing patent law. Um, for the trademark side of it, you know, I just, I almost wish that someone would have told me what to major in. I honestly was looking for the major to become, and I wanted to be a, originally an entertainment lawyer, like this is all I wanted to do. And I did uh, a lot of research and I was just like, what do I major in? What do I major in? And I was just looking through everything I could find and Star Jones at the time is who popped up in my research and Star Jones went to American University she majored in political science. And so I said, fine, that's what I'll do. Uh, didn't know what political science was when I majored in it. And to be frank, I barely know what it is now, even though I have a degree in it, right? Like, <laughs> you know, I just, I was just looking for that avenue and learning that uh, there was no specific, there's no specific path to get there. And I think we can all say that there's not very many specific paths that we can go on to our law degree anyway. But I think it's, I'm always just trying to encourage people not to feel like whatever they choose has put them in any sort of box, right? No, I cannot be a um, patent practitioner uh, because I don't have a science degree, but I could, if I wanted to, I could participate in some patent litigation. I know a lot of people who do litigation without having a science degree, right? It's like, so all of these opportunities are available. So, you know, I just try to spread the word through programs like these. It's less, I think it's not needed as much for, uh, say, for instance, UNH, but other law schools or other opportunities that I have to speak with people who are interested in IP say, hey, it's not just one way to get there. Um, and there's not just um, one area of the practice either. It's not just patents. It's not just trademarks. It can be a combination. It could be either or. Um, and the world can really kind of be your oyster if you're interested in it. And uh, certainly when I explain what I do, a lot, a lot of people say, wow, that sounds a lot more interesting than uh, a will or an estate. And I said, yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, it'll be the most fun, the most fun cases that you'll probably read, uh, especially when you think about um, just, just kind of those run of the mill ones when you're like, yeah, okay, standing. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, this matters. Someone slipped, someone fell. Um, it sounds fun. So that's what I try to do. Just say anyone can do it. Um, and you can, here's another exciting area of practice. That's awesome. Yes, we all love torch so much. Um, <laughs> uh, does the audience have any uh, questions they would like to ask the panelists? Uh, that includes the Zoom audience. You can submit um, in the chat. If not, I have some more questions here we can go to. But uh, Mr. Sorota. Uh, hi, first of all, uh, my name is Neil Sorota. I'm the interim assistant dean for career services. Um, so it's great to meet all of you. I actually had one comment to say that when I took trademarks, my favorite case was the trademarking of the sound of a Harley Davidson motorcycle. So it's incredibly uh, delightful to see you here. Um, I actually had two questions. The first was um, from the point of view of uh, administration and career services, if there are things that either you saw in law schools or see things now that we can do uh, to help uh, our students be successful in IP. I'll, I'll start as a, um, I mean, now granted, you know, I graduated 12 years ago from a, from a different school, but um, I, 
you know, there was a lot of people doing on-campus interviews and things for patent that were patent specific. And as someone who was not interested in patent law, and if that's you, uh, you might find that you might have a more difficult time. Maybe th things might be different now, but you might find that you have a lot more difficulty in um, getting the, the same amount of looks and the same amount of um, interest uh, and just maybe ease. And it, I really had to take it upon myself um, using some of the same strategies that the other panelists were speaking about and making my way to find my my role. And I did talk to career services and, and don't, don't get me wrong, they were helpful. I'd say, hey, I'm interested in doing this. And they would point me in the path of other people who would then help me make other connections, right? So it may not have been so as simple as submitting my resume, having an, having an interview, even though I know on OCI might be um, I might have gotten ahead of myself with the pandemic, right? I don't know how things have changed uh, in that fashion as well, but certainly I had to work a little bit harder and be more um, proactive myself. Looking back, I wish I'd had even more conversations with career services, um, but I just was determined that like, you know what, I got to go at this on my own. I have to create my own opportunities, and I didn't let what may or may not have been presented for me or the opportunities there stand in my way and I just continue to try to uh, forge a path for myself uh, through through my own networking connections, which I will admit were not very good um, because I was too shy to reach out to many people, but those that I did were always willing to help and you know enabled me to make the connections to find the summer roles, to get the opportunities to then set myself up for a job after law school. I, I can speak, you know, real quickly to that. Um, I, I think, I think uh, mentorship programs um, would really help out um, in those, you know, in forging those paths. Like you said, um, your network in the beginning uh, wasn't as good as it could be. Um, if if there are um, alums, you know, that you could reach out to um, um, at your law program and that they will have an, a vested interest to uh, helping, you know, these students coming along now, um, they, um, they've they already um, been down that road. Now they have a network um, that can be of help, you know, to that law student. So I think if you could set up, you know, certain mentorship programs in different um, areas of the law, I think that could move the needle a lot also. Anyone else have a comment? Yeah, I guess the one thing I would add to that from the law firm perspective, um, and, and this sort of aligns with something that Andrea was saying, uh, we, we over the years that I have been here done interviewing, we, we do get a, a you know not insignificant number of applicants who have an interest in IP and in, in patent litigation in particular, uh, but perhaps don't have the scientific background, uh, and and I just want to give you a word of encouragement, um, but also a dose of reality, and that is that um, some of our uh, most effective and fantastic litigators here at the firm actually are people who don't have science degrees, because at the end of the day, what I have to do as a litigator is take something that many times is complex and be able to explain that to a lay jury or to a judge who doesn't have a technical background. And I've got a, you know, people who are listening to me are probably too young to remember the Three Stooges in any real sense, but I've got a partner who would always say that, you know, people who have science degrees and speak in that way, what they say to the judge and the jury often can sound like a Three Stooges routine where they say, look, the way this works is you just connect the Anakan of Frenistan to the Wanakana Pooner and it works just fine. What, what does that mean? Nobody has any idea what you're talking about. What, one of the key things that I have to be able to do and that Marisa has to be able to do as outside counsel is be able to communicate effectively. The challenge that you face when you don't have a science degree is that you have to overcome the inertia that the firms have um, to give you an opportunity in the first instance and say, look, we've got a limited number of spots. I've got you know, three or four candidates here who have science degrees. Um, you don't tell me why it is 
I should go into the room with our summer associate hiring committee and advocate on your behalf, despite the fact that you don't have a science degree. You got to walk into your interview with an answer to that question. And if you're not asked, you need to volunteer. I know I don't have a science degree. Here's why I'm good anyway. Here's why you should hire me anyway. And to your um, to your question, Dean, what can what can you do uh, from a career development standpoint at the school? It's those people who fi who find themselves in that circumstance. You know, got, try to guide them to take the core courses uh, that they need to take. Uh, and also, if there are opportunities to work with professors or do internships or externships, because what the firms are going to be looking for at the end of the day, I think, is the word is demonstrated. Do you have a demonstrated interest in IP? Uh, and there are some firms that that may not get you over the hump, but if you if you don't have that demonstrated interest, despite the lack of a science degree, it's going to be really challenging. Um, and keep at it just because, you know, one or two firms, like I was saying before, I, you know, I've been now at Fish 19 years and I applied for a summer position here and didn't get one. And if I had thrown my hands up and said, oh, well, that didn't work. They don't want me. I'm done. I, I, I wouldn't have built the career here that I have now. So keep that intestinal fortitude and, and keep going after it and have a plan like Andrea said. Would you like to add? No, I think the panel has covered it. Awesome. Uh, any other questions? Online, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat. And while we wait on that, um, so researchers from the University of Michigan have found that Black professionals who tend to code switch more frequently also report significantly more workplace fatigue and burnout from their current positions. Uh, what are your experiences with code switching in the legal field, and how has it impacted your perspective on working in law? And uh, we can start with you, Ms. Frederick, on this one. So I probably code switched more when I was a very junior associate. And I think that it took me a while to feel comfortable with my colleagues, comfortable with who I, who I was, um, comfortable with how I was developing as an attorney. Um, but I think that the longer you work, the more experience that you get, you're more comfortable being yourself and showing people how you truly are. And so I'll have to say the amount of code switching I do now is probably a lot less <laughs> and it requires me probably to explain a lot more at work. Um, so I, I think it, it really is, is tied a lot to just experience and, and you building the kind of relationships that you need to build at work where you can truly be yourself. Awesome. Um, James, yeah. would you like to take this next, take it next? Oh, uh, see, you want to mute it, Mr. Davis? <laughs> go ahead, you can give it to James. I'll wait my turn. <laughs> you got it, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I can, I can wait, I can wait. Yeah, so um, this one, it, so I love Marisa's answer. Um, I, I'm gonna, gonna start off with a saying that, that both Andrea and Marisa know well, and that is um, you can always tell a Morehouse man, but you can't tell him much. Um, I probably would take this whole code switching thing and put that squarely in the category of perhaps do as I say and not as I always do. Um, I showed up for better or for worse with a sense of, of confidence about myself and felt like in, in order to protect the sanity of my being, I needed to be able to come to work as my authentic self, as much as I possibly could from the beginning. Knowing full well that that might rub some people the wrong way, um, that that might create issues, but my approach was really twofold, number one, if I do excellent work, uh, if I demonstrate that I am, am, I need to be here, I should be here, and I'm excelling here, uh, then it'll be easier and more palatable. And number two, I really try to use it as a, as a teaching tool, as a taking off point, as a conversation point to educate my colleagues, my friends, the people that I work with 
um, and to create an environment that hopefully will cause people to ask questions. If you don't code switch, if you stay yourself and you are authentic and real with people, um, then and you develop those relationships, then um, then you really can grow people and educate them and, and help them learn, which, I mean, to me, at the end of the day, um, you've heard from James, you've heard from Andrea. I can't remember if Marisa said this, um, but I know that it's true for her in many ways. When I showed up here at Fish, I wasn't the only Black attorney we've ever had, but I was the only one at the time. Um, and I'm the only full equity partner that we've had here now. And, um, you know, when President Obama was president, I would tell people regularly, I want you to step back and I want you to think about this for a moment. Our firm started in the 1870s. And with all of the difficult, challenging, sordid past that we have as a country, this country had a black president before this firm had a black full equity partner. And it started in the 1870s. And so I really felt like I had a weight on my shoulders to, to come here and to, to make a difference in the suicide that people perhaps hadn't already, always seen. And I have, it, it certainly is easier as you get more senior and you make principal or make partner um, but but I am of the view that to really advance the ball for diversity and for understanding, um, going in as your authentic self really is the best way to go. Provided, Jalon, and I'm I'm pointing him out and calling him out because he's joining our firm this summer as a summer associate. Provided that you come in and your work is on point. If you come in and your work is stellar, then that gives you latitude to be your authentic self much more so than if you come in and you're half-stepping, that's, that's not going to work. Yes, sir. And um, the car name always uh, comes with stellar work. I can promise you that. And, um, you know, referring to code switching, I definitely felt in my interview with you more comfortable than I have felt in the interview um, before or it, before doing that. So definitely, I think that um, your take on that is very, very impactful, not even in the firm, but just even in uh, how you recruit um, your associates. Um, James, would you like to take it next? Or I'm sorry, Andrea. James, go on. Oh, I mean, I'll just keep mine short. Um, you know, um, similar to um, I met, uh, I didn't code switch much when I started uh, my career either um, you know and it's different levels to how you're supposed to act so when you're hanging with your friends you know you act a certain way you don't have to switch it all the way when you're in the workplace you can still be yourself but you have to still be uh, professional and I tell people that um, with my colleagues at IBM uh, they appreciated me being myself. Um, they had questions. They they wanted to learn our culture. They wanted to know different things about my perspective, you know, from where I came from and how it is here. Um, they wanted to make sure that I felt comfortable and and that, you know, I appreciated that while still being my authentic self. And I think it helped me there, um, you know, uh, while I was there for it was only like five years, but um, it still helped me in that position. So, you know, I'll tell anyone, you know, if you can be yourself within limits, obviously, um, there are some things I would say at home, you know, that I wouldn't say in the workplace. And that's a given, that's just common sense, not necessarily code switching, but, you know, going to it, um, be yourself, because there are gonna be times where you forget to go back and forth if you do choose to do that, and that could be a detriment to you. Um, I did have one short story where I was, you know, when I was in my company, I was reaching out to different attorneys, you know, just telling them about what we're doing. And I was speaking with a gentleman from um, Black and Decker, and I didn't realize it, but um, I was a little comfortable. And, you know, you know, you have to watch that as well. You, you can't be, too comfortable with someone that you're just meeting. Um, still keep that um, level of uh, professionalism up, and um, you know, and you'll go far uh, just being yourself. Awesome, thank you. 
I, uh, I agree with, with everything that everyone said. Um, just coming from maybe a different angle and thinking about uh, it as a, as a law student, certainly it's a, it's a little scarier. Um, for me, uh, as, a, as a gay woman as well, I was also concerned about how, how I would choose to show up or what that would look like or what the ramifications were or could be. So certainly there was a, a level of apprehension for me. Um, and similar to, I guess it also worked out as what Ahmed said, basically, I, I read this article, it was like, you know, this woman who used to wear suits and ties every day, she showed up to work and essentially, um, she, she was very confident, never said a word about it, like never made a big deal about it. And no one else made a big deal about it, right? It was like, there, because there wasn't, there wasn't a big deal. It was, this is who she was. And so after I read that, I was like, okay, this is it. Like, whoever I am is who I am. It's, it's just how I am, right? Like, so I'm just going to show up every day and that's that. And I think that has served me well because um, it's never, it's never a topic of conversation, right? Nor should it be, but it's not like, oh, tell me more about this. Or it's just like, this is, this is what, this is what it is. This is, you know, it's not surprising if I say I went to, well, pre-pandemic, I went to a step show this weekend with my wife. It's like, it is what it is, right? That is, that is how it goes. How, that's how, that's how it is. I'm for the, I keep saying that's how it is uh, because that's how I've created it. Um, and no one around me cares. And certainly when we're looking at, um, it doesn't matter for me talking to you, we don't hire law students. So we would never get a fresh, law, we would never get a fresh law student in house, but at a firm, I think it's kind of like those same principles of, you know, it's yet you have to make that decision on how comfortable you're going to be. But at the end of the day, you want to be at a place where you feel comfortable because if you have to pretend to be someone else, it is going to get tiring. And eventually you're going to leave because you won't be able to feel like you can ever relax or ever be yourself. So um, just, it might be difficult to figure out, you know, what your pr professional persona is to James's point where you're going to draw the line, but you have to decide what that professional persona is or professional you is and just be that person. That is awesome. All right, we have a minute left. So, and we, you know, this is a event that's hosted by the Student Social Property Law Association, BALSA, and uh, the Diversity Coalition here at um, UNH Law. Um, so for all of the African-American students and our allies here at the school, um, what is one lasting, you know, 15, 20 second spiel that you would like to leave us with here today? And we can start with uh, Ms. Frederick. I think it's what I've already um, said before, network, network, network. Make sure you reach out to people in the legal community and make those connections it can go a long way in helping you navigate your career and figuring out this this legal environment thank you James. Uh, oh Andrea, you're the unh law alum you have to be the you have to be the capstone <laughs> okay so i'll i'll just say that you know definitely focus on these few years of your life because i mean they're going to determine the next 20, 30, 40 years of your life, you know, whatever that may be, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, networking, uh, your grades, um, all of that, you know, just make sure you keep your head down and do what you need to do right now uh, to get you prepared for the next step. Awesome, Mr. Davis. Have a plan, work hard, have fun while you're doing it and realize that not everything works out the way that you always want it to, but you can overcome anyway. And remember that um, somebody sacrificed so that you can be where you are. Uh, pay it forward uh, and uh, always keep that in mind. Thank you. Andrea? I tried to jump in second before all of the good stuff was taken and uh, you thwarted my plan. Uh, <laughs> I, so I would, I would say, um, you have to do the work and you have to do good work. Uh, it doesn't matter any of the other things that we've spoken about. If you're networking, if you are looking the part, if you're confident, if you can meet the right people, even if you get the job, it doesn't matter if the work product isn't there. So uh, in, all, in all aspects, make sure that you're doing and focusing and putting out uh, the best work that you can, the best product. Uh, there's no half stepping for your work. That'll, that will take you far. 
Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here with us today. I really appreciate you uh, providing your insight on this issue or on this uh, on this uh, topic. And um, I look forward to speaking with all of you in the future. And hopefully, we'll have you back here again soon. Thank y'all very much, and thank you for showing up and attending today. Thank you. Thank you.